Okay. Yes, everybody here. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the plan for uh, this morning session. This morning I will uh, go through the discourse uh, and discuss as much as you can. In the afternoon I will uh, select certain points that has, have to be stretched, elaborate, explain. So this morning I simply wanted to uh, start with the discourse. This is called Alagadda Upama Sutta. Alagadda is a snake. This may be a special snake, maybe water snake, or more poisonous snake. Normally, uh, a snake is called Sapa. Uh, we can see this in the discourse. Pali word is Sapa. Alagadda also is another name for snake, poisonous snake, maybe more poisonous. Upama is simile. So Alagadda Upama means snake simile. The simile of the snake. You see the discourse, a bhikkhu named Arita gives rise to a pernicious view that uh, conduct uh, is prohibited by the Buddha is not really an obstruction. The, the Arita thought what Buddha said is obstruct our attaining liberation, Aritya says, it is not so. We will read that discourse. Buddha reprimands him and uh, with a series of memorable similes, stresses the dangers in <coughs> misapplying and misrepresenting the Dhamma. The Sutta culminates in one of the most impressive discussions on non-self found in the canon. So, let us start with the discourse. So, on this occasion, on one occasion, uh, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Aritta, formerly of the vulture killers. Vulture's killer is known as uh, Gaddabadi uh, Gaddabadi Pubba Pubba means previously in the past he used to kill vultures what is his pernicious view this is very important for us to remember as I understand the Dhamma told by the Blessed One those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Now he does not specify what kind of ob ob things that obstruct the one who uh, practice Dhamma with the intention of attaining liberation. So he did not specify. So, however, assuming what those obstructions are, uh, several monks, and this point we will stress later on in the afternoon, uh, what made him think that what Buddha said obstructive is not obstructive. What made him think? Why he thought like that? We will discuss this afternoon. So several bhikkhus having heard about this went to Bhikkhu Arita and asked him, 
friend Arita, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Now, in the community of Sangha, among monks and nuns, if one monk or one nun has uh, some uh, wrong views, misunderstanding, everybody don't keep quiet. Everybody wants him to correct himself. Why? Everybody wants him to be on the right track and everybody wants out of compassion. Everybody wants him to get into the right track so that uh, he will not develop wrong thoughts, uh, wrong views about the Dhamma. Why is that? Because it will, we will see this later on, it will be harmful to him for a long time in this life as well as in future existence. And therefore, out of compassion, these monks went to him and asked him, is it true that you are holding this view? What is the view? That if, the, although the Buddha said certain things are obstructive, but I don't think uh, they are really obstructing. Then this bhikkhus, desiring to detach him from the pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. So he, it is very important, uh, he did not get offended. He was not upset. He simply complied with these monk's questions, the support. He went along with them. He wanted to say honestly, yes. So he said, friends, are it, uh, they asked, they said, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the blessing, blessed one. It is not good to uh, misrepresent the blessed one. The blessed one would not speak thus. For in many ways, the blessed one has stated how obstructing, obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. And so forth, they try to persuade him, advise him. And they also said, there are some other discourses like uh, where Buddha mentioned uh, uh, these uh, dangers, of uh, danger in them, uh, so much suffering. So they want, they picked only one of the dangers, one of the obstructions, out of many obstructions. They picked only one. What is that? Sense desire. Sense desire is, uh, gets in our way. We learn about uh, various type of sense desires. Seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, and thinking of sensual pleasures, trying to please senses. And these monks said, with the simile of a skeleton. A skeleton is uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, at at the sankali kupa at the sankala Upama. Atta Sankala means skeleton. But the simile is not referring to whole skeleton. The original uh, simile is uh, uh, 
Suppose there is a dog, very hungry, looking for food and going here and there, running around looking for food and then he stops by a butcher shop, smelling the blood and he was waiting there. So the butcher, just to get rid of him, took a piece of bone. All the flesh is removed and blood smeared bone throws at him. So this dog keeps naving, licking, 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 hoping to get some flesh out of that bone. The more he licks, more instead of coming flesh from the bone, the blood comes from his own tongue. So as he keep licking, he tastes his own blood. Then he thinks this bone has flesh. So he keep licking and licking and licking until he, his hunger increases, desire increases, never gets any satisfaction. He simply keeps licking it, naming it. And Buddha said, sensual pleasure is like that. Never ever be satisfied. It is insatiable. So this one simile is enough for Aritya to give up his view. That this, so long as one has this desire, it is not possible for that person to attain liberation. Attaining liberation, number one, is letting go of our desire. Tanha kaya. Tanha means craving. Craving is uh, uh, is very uh, most dangerous primary obstruction to attaining liberation. Porno bhavika, nandira sahagata, tatra tatra binandini, it re becoming, re, re arising. Uh, here delight, there and greed arises, and there delight, greed arises and so forth, and we like this, and next time like that, and so on. It goes on and on and on, never stops. With that, how can one be liberated? It, the Nibbana means cessation of craving. If the if with the craving, if somebody attain, try to attain Nibbana, it will never happen. So Arita did not think of that. These monks tried to persuade him, don't think that the obstructions that the Buddha mentioned would not be obstruction. They will be obstruction. This is one. So they gave similes. These, uh, these we, similes we find some other discourses uh, in the Buddha. Then the next simile is piece of meat. Uh, piece of meat uh, is is it always sticks to uh, something. And uh, suppose uh, a bird pick a piece of meat and flies, then suppose a vulture, all other vultures also come after him to get that piece of meat from him. So he keeps holding this piece of meat. He keeps flying and flying and flying. All other birds are coming to attack him to get this piece of meat. Unless he gives up this piece of meat, he will have no freedom because others also want to have the same piece of meat because they are hungry, they are jealous, they are greedy. They also want to get that. Just think of this. Then, next is the simile of grass torch. If you have a torch with the, with, which is uh, lit, instead of uh, when you run with it, it will, flame will come towards you and burn your hand, burn your hair, 
burn your clothes and you will be in great danger. Then, with the simile of pit of coals in the Sanyuti Nikaya, uh, in order to explain uh, past contact, Buddha gave this simile. Suppose there is a man who wants to live, not to, doesn't want to die, uh, two people, very strong two people come and drag him to a pit of coal. This man would struggle to get f free from these pe two people. Why is that? He doesn't want to get burned in the pit of coal. And the next simile is a dream. Of course, in dreams, we have all kind of wonderful things. When you open your eyes, <laughs> there is nothing. In fact, if somebody were to think of all the sensual pleasures one has experienced in life and think of them, all of them are gone. None of them is there right now. Only the thought is there. It is not different from the thought of dream you had at night in sleep. All sensual pleasures are like that. Then the second is even more, even better, borrowed goods. Suppose you borrow something, maybe a very expensive, attractive looking suit for a, somebody's wedding. You borrow it and you are walking around among people showing off your very expensive, very beautiful dress. Then the man who loaned it to you would come and tap on your shoulder and say, I need this dress tomorrow <laughs> or to loan it to somebody. Don't uh, dirty it and return it tomorrow early morning. How you feel? You feel very embarrassed. So then the next is the fruits of tree on trees. Suppose there is a tree full of fruit, very delicious fruit, everybody wants to eat that, but one man climbs up and keeps eating. Another man comes with an axe because he cannot climb. He wants to cut the tree to get the fruit. Then what would you do? <laughs> if you stay on the tree, this man will cut the tree and you will fall and die. Before he cuts the tree, you have to get down. So let it go. And the butcher's knife is the next simile. Butcher's knife is uh, uh, you in uh, English you say licking honey in the on the sharp sword. Uh, butcher has. Uh, uh, use a knife and it smeared with blood and you give to a dog and he will cut his tongue by trying to lick at lick this uh, meat and then sword stake also similar then then simile of a snake head a snake head is even more dangerous all these similes Buddha has given and these monks tried to mention all these similes and said the danger of sensual pleasures. And Arita did not think of this. <clears throat> Since they could not persuade him to give up his views, uh, they went to the uh, Buddha and reported this. Then the Buddha called him uh, this similes, their way of trying to persuade him and so forth, is repeated several times in the discourse. I am trying to avoid these repetitions. Then uh, when he was brought to the Buddha, uh, when this message was, when they reported this to the Buddha, Buddha sent the bhikkhu 
and asked uh, Aritta to come and see him. When Aritta came to see the Buddha, Buddha asked, uh, is it true that uh, you have such and such a view? Uh, you said, as I understand the Dhamma, that Dhamma told by the Blessed on those things called obstructions by the Blessed who are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Arita did not uh, hesitate without any hesitation. He is exactly so, Venerable Sir. Exactly so, Venerable Sir. As I understand so forth, he repeated. Then Buddha used a very strong term, misguided man. <clears throat> this is a very strong term Buddha used to reprimand somebody. Actually, Pali word is uh, Moga Purusha. Moga Purusha means confused person. Moga Purusha. Uh, or misguided man. To whom have I ever known me? Uh, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are, uh, uh, things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them? Then Buddha also used the same simile and repeated the same similes. And then <clears throat> Buddha said, sensual pleasures has have stated that the sensual pleasures uh, provide little gratification, but much suffering and despair. Little satisfaction is there, but much suffering. And that the danger in them is, is still more. But you misguided man and so forth, you, <coughs> your wrong grasp have misrepresented us. Means you misrepresented me. Injured yourself and stored up much demerits. For this will lead you lead to harm and suffering for a long time. Now, <clears throat> Buddha taught the Dhamma uh, very clearly and uh, only for the benefit of liberating oneself from samsara. If somebody misrepresent him, mis under, mis misrepresent him, he will cause lot of harm to himself as well as to others. So <clears throat> he asked because out of compassion, because do you also understand the Dhamma like this? They said, no, Venerable Sir. Uh, then the Blessed One said that, because do you understand Dhamma taught by me as this Bhikkhu Arita formerly of the vulture killers? Thus, when by his wrong grasp he misrepresents us, injures himself, stores up much demerits. Here, uh, marriage means that state of mind which guides us in right direction. That is, in other words, a skill, a skillful thought. We have to have a skillful thought to live in the society where there are lot of unskillful persons, unskillful, unskillful views. And therefore, in order to avoid all these unskillful thoughts and views and discussions and ideas, we have to have a skillful thought. 
it is the skillful thought that leads us in right direction and therefore the misrepresenting the buddha is very unskillful demeritorious thought so when uh, other bhikkhus got uh, assurance or uh, accepted uh, the buddha's teaching uh <clears throat> buddha repeated the same similes and then he gave the simile of snake this is the title of the discourse simile of the snake here because some misguided men learn the dhamma a uh, discourse stances exposition verses ex- uh, exclamations sayings bird stories marvels and answers to questions these are called nine limbs of dhamma nine limbs, limbs of dhamma they are uh, sutta sutta means discourses uh, gaya second is gaya means that which is which is used for chanting uh, gatha gatha means chanting like in mangala sutra and so forth we have mostly gatha dhammapada gatha then exposition the pali word is vayya karana uh, vayya karana means analytical exposition of the dhamma then as senses and verses especially composed for reciting like udana uh, at the end of uh, certain discourses it the entire discourse is summarized in verses then excl- exclamations particularly in udana all the de- uh, stanzas in udana are exclamations then sayings short uh, statements bird stories are called jataka uh, jataka <coughs> there are one is called jataka commentary other is called jataka jataka means bird stories the buddhas uh, uh, buddha simply mention the jataka uh, stanzas and later on commentators wrote commentaries and made many many stories then marvels explain marvelous things uh, wonderful things and the last is vedalla in vajjaminika there are two vedallas vedalla means questions and answers like catechismic teaching is called vedalla there are two discourses in majjhimikaya chula vedalla and maha vedalla so somebody learn these things buddha says uh with wrong intention they they uh, not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom they do not gain reflective acceptance of them instead now not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom when we learn the dhamma we must use our wisdom to examine them rather than parroting them simply memorizing them memorizing them <clears throat> is good to some extent for even when when one memorizes one must use those memorized dhamma for reflection to think very carefully mindfully the meaning of those things that one memorized otherwise memorizing in itself doesn't do any good to us 
and therefore examining the meaning of those things with wisdom, uh, not just to uh, engage in the entertain oneself, but with wisdom. They do not gain reflective acceptance of them and simply learn and memorize. Instead, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates, and they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. Now, you can see the purpose of learning Dhamma here. Uh, criticizing others and for winning debates in debates. Uh, suppose I give a Dhamma talk and you all listen to it and always you are thinking of loopholes in my talk. Where to find how, how did he pronounce this word? Uh, how did he explain it? I can explain it better. I know better vocabulary and uh, I know how to pronounce this word properly. Instead of understanding the message, if you were to think of a way to criticize the Dhamma that I deliver, then you miss the point, you miss the boat. So if you try very hard to understand the message, not the way of the messenger, but try to understand the message. Uh, <clears throat> or memorize Dhamma. In a discussion, you go to a certain place where others don't know anything about Dhamma. You learn a little bit of Dhamma here and there, and then you, you want to show off. You bring up certain certain subjects and you throw some of your Dhamma points just to win the argument. Very good example is, uh, I think, uh, this monk will deliver his talk on Kalama Sutta. Whenever somebody wants to get away from anything he does, he uses Kalama Sutta. <laughs> Buddha said in Kala Sutta, don't believe in this, don't believe in that, therefore I don't believe anything you say. It could be even the Buddha said, don't believe in, in even in me. Buddha never said, don't believe in me. Buddha never said, he, don't believe in his teaching, which you would never find in the discourse, but there, use it as an excuse to get away with anything they want to do. Those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? Because of the wrong grasp of those teachings. Friends, then the Buddha gave this simile. Suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, so a large snake and grasp its coil or its tail, it would turn back on him and bite his hand or his arms or uh, one of his limbs. And because of that, he would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that? Because of this wrong grasp of the snake. So, <clears throat> that is very important simile to remember. <clears throat> if we don't understand the Dhamma, question. Uh, so Buddha said, here because some clansmen learn the Dhamma, Dhamma discourse, 
delivered by the Buddha or one of his learned disciples, uh, then answer ask questions. Having learned the Dhamma, they examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they gain reflective acceptance of them. Nijjana Kanti. Reflective acceptance is uh, they don't uh, swallow everything naively, but then they examine the meaning of those words. And how we examine? We must ask ourselves, how does this Dhamma help me to get rid of my greed, get rid of my anger? get it on my fear, tension. How can I apply this Dhamma to get it on my own weaknesses? So that is how he must criticize, analyze the Dhamma as he studies. So they do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates and they experience good for the sake of which they learn the Dhamma. You know, when we learn the Dhamma, we do not think, ah, this Dhamma is talking about so and so. I know so and so is such and such a nasty person. This Dhamma is talking about them, about him or about her. Buddha says not like that. When we listen to Dhamma, we must think, this is what I want to know. This is, he is talking to me. He is talking to me. He addresses my problem. I want to use this Dhamma to get rid of my problem. I must focus on my weaknesses, my defilements. How can I use this to use, use this to get rid of my problem? Always we must look at ourselves because where is the Dhamma? Where is Dhamma? Dhamma is in us. Dhamma is not in books, not in discourses. What the books and discourses uh, do is pointing out what we have in us. When I talk about greed, I don't have to ask about your greed. I must ask my own greed, my own desire. How to get it on my desire when I talk about desire? So, similarly, when we learn the Dhamma, we must learn it in a correct way. Correct way is the way to use it in our own life for our own benefit. <clears throat> so, Buddha said, on the other hand, uh, so a large snake caught it rightly with the chef cleft stick and having done so, grasped it rightly by the neck. Ah, is the, it's called Ajapada, it's a cleft, what do you call, uh, cleft stick, Ajapada. It has like, you press him down and catch him by his neck. So that he will not turn right. He may, he may coil around your hand, but his body cannot hurt you, body cannot sting you. So you have to grasp it. So the head of this Dhamma snake is in our head. This is the head we have to catch, not somebody else's head. When we learn the Dhamma, go to our head and ask how much poison I have in my head. Right? 
never try to find out poison in others' head. So it is this head that has poison, and it is this head that must be caught very tightly. My head. So, <clears throat> therefore, because when you understand the meaning of my te- my my statement, remember it accordingly. And when you do not understand the meaning of my statements, then ask either me about it or those bhikkhus who are wise. You know this is what we have to do. Ask me. Super into the Buddha, not me. <laughs> in this, in this discussion, I I just uh, repeat what the Buddha said. Or ask somebody who is wiser than us. Wiser than us. If there is any confusion, don't go away with the confusion. Get the confusion clarified, so that you will not. Misrepresent the Dhamma or the Buddha. <clears throat> That's what we are going to do this afternoon, asking questions. Okay, then another thing. This also is very important simile. The first simile is about wrong grasp of Dhamma. And how the how we grasp the dhamma rightly, correctly. Then the second simile is gr- about grasping. The you know, first simile is not wrongly grasping. Second simile is uh, about the grasping itself. Okay. Because I shall show you the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Ah. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. You must remember this sentence in Pali. Kullu pamang bhikkhe dhamman desi sami nitharanatayano ganatay. Because I teach the Dhamma, Kullu Pamango Dhamma Desi Swami, Kullu Pamango Bhikkhire Dhamma Desi Swami, Nithra Nattaya Noga Nattaya. Thangshu Nata Sadhuka Manasika Rocha, Buddha said. I teach you Dhamma similar to raft. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. So Bhikkhu says yes. Then you can see the way Buddha was approaching. Suppose a man in. Let me summarize it. <coughs> a man wants to. Man finds. Is uh, in a certain area he lives. Find that area is full of animals, snakes, tigers, lions, elephants, all are harmful. Now he wants to escape all of them. Then he keeps running, running for his life, and keep running, 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 come across a river. He wants, but. On the other side of the river, a mass of water. He said, but we assume that is a river. On the other side is safe. No um, snakes, no tigers, no elephants, and so forth to attack us. So he wants to go to the other side. What should he do? There is no boat, no bridge. So he. In desperation, because these animals are chasing, coming behind him, so he wants to cross the body of water. So what does he do? He look around. He find some twigs, leaves, 
creepers, barks of trees, and he put all of them together, tied with the barks and jump into it. And then, with the help of the temporary makeshift raft, using his hands and legs, he cross the body of water and go to the safe, to the other shore, which is <coughs> safer. There is no fear. Uh, so, and then, man collect this. Now, because Buddha said, what do you think? By doing so, uh, suppose, this, if this man said, I got safely across the across the far shore. Suppose I were to hoist it on my head or uh, load it on my shoulder and then go wherever I want. Buddha says, now because, what do you think? By doing so, would that man be doing what should be done with, the, with that raft? Answer is, no venerable sir. <clears throat> then by doing what that man be doing, what should be done with that raft? So he would be they said he should they should uh, he should uh, leave it behind or pull it to the shore and let it be there. So uh, suppose I were to hold, uh, hold it onto the dry land or set it adrift in the water and then go wherever I want. Now because it is by so doing that that man would be doing what should be done with the raft. So I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to raft being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. We want to emphasize this point in the afternoon discussion, but briefly I must say, somebody may say, ask uh, uh, at this point, if we don't uh, hold on to Dhamma very tightly, <coughs> how can we practice it? We must believe, we must uh, uh, be very honest and sincere, and we must uh, uh, give up our life for the Dhamma, I kill myself for Dhamma, for the sake of Dhamma, that is why I should practice. Don't you think that is the way one should practice Dhamma? One must have a very firm, deep commitment. I will do anything for, for the sake of Dhamma. Don't you think that is the way we should be? Okay, you think of this question. In the afternoon, we are going to have a discussion on it. Anyway, Buddha said, even the Dhamma, we should not cling, cling even to Dhamma, not grasp it. But, <clears throat> Buddha said, Bhikkhu, when you know that Dhamma, Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even the teachings. How much more so that so much more things contrary to the teachings. Now, the, this teaching itself is a uh, little ambiguous, not clear. Uh, Buddha used the word Dhamma. Pageva Adam Dhamma 
and adharma uh, are two things. Uh, dhamma is uh, truth. In short, dhamma is truth. Adhamma is not truth. We will have a good discussion in the afternoon on this. Dhamma, Adhamma. Buddha used the word Dhamma Pageva uh, uh, Dhamma. Let alone Adam. Uh, <coughs> yeah, you also can refer to the notes. Uh, it is much uh, simpler for us to understand. Remember, to avoid the confusion, if we use the word Dhamma only for truth, then we will have a discussion in the afternoon what this truth is. Okay. How much more so things contrary to the teachings? Okay. Then, now, Bhikkhu Arita, Venerable Arita, was holding to some views. So, <coughs> these are the views. Okay. There are six views. One view is the who are the ones who have these views? Here because an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma. The word true men is a literal translation of uh, Sappurisa. Sappurisa. Uh, we have little problem with the word true man, true man, not the true man president. This is different true man, true men. The Pali word is sub purisa, sat in Sanskrit is true. Purusha means person. So translation is true person or true man. Uh, Maybe a little confusing therefore. I think the better translation should be person with integrity. Person with integrity. Or there is a discourse in Majjhimini called Sappurusa Sutta, the noble person, Sappurusa, or person with integrity. Who has these wrong views? One who has, uh, who does, has not, uh, who is untaught ordinary person. Untaught means 
not illiterate person. He may be a literal person, person literate, educated in the various secular things, but he has not learned the Dhamma. That's called Putujjana. Putujjana. The belong, belonging to the mass who don't have that deep understanding of Dhamma. And therefore, untaught ordinary person, ordinary person who is not learned the Dhamma, who has no regard for noble ones, they don't care for them, because they don't they are not interested in them. And unskilled, unskilled in their uh, Dhamma, undisciplined in their Dhamma, in the noble one's Dhamma, who has no regard for the noble person, and unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma. And this is the person who regards material form thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. This, this, in Pali, etang mama, eso hamasmi, eso me atta. These are the three terms used for tanna, mana, ditti. Tanna means this is mine. When you say this is mine, it means it expresses desire. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. It expresses desire. Tanna. Pali word Tanna. This I am. <coughs> the moment we say I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, what do we express? Conceit. Conceit. Mana in Pali Mana. Uh, mana is uh, Pali word mana means measure. When you want to measure something, use use certain measurement. Here mana means I <coughs> I am the standard to measure everybody. I am the, the criterion. So I measure all of all of you according to my own measurement. How tall I am, how tall you are, how educated you are, how educated I am, and, and so forth and so on. So I measure all of you according to my measurement. I am the standard. So everybody must, I, I measure everybody by my standard. And therefore, this I am, that is called mana. This is myself. This is ditti, view. In Pali, tanha, mana, ditti. Tanha is craving, mana means conceit. Dikti means views or wrong views or mm, myself. So, uh, regard material form, form, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Feeling, this is mine, this I am, this myself, and so forth. Five aggregates. What are the five aggregates? Form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. So there are 15 ways 
of seeing, form, feeling, perceptions, and so on. That means we multiply these five by three, so we get fifteen. What are the three? Tanna, mana, ditti. Mind, I, myself. And then the last one is uh, four views, namely that which is the self is the world. After that, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too he regards thus: this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Now, the view itself is divided into three. View itself is divided into three. What is the view? This is the self. That is tanna mana ditti view, and this self. Existing something different from these five aggregates, self, and this self. Of course, this is not something new. Uh, throughout the history of uh, religions and philosophy, people were talking about self, uh, and this self. They try to define it in many ways, and each time if somebody came up with counter argument, then they come up with something different. Just like uh, you know, this uh, some insect life, insect when you find some kind of insecticide, then next generation new insect will arise that will be immune to this. Then you produce, you uh, invent something to kill them. Then next generation will have different type of insect. So, like that, people who want to tenaciously hold on to their notion of self came up with all kind of uh, reasoning for self. Finally. They would say, "Self is the reflection of life. Self is a shadow. Self is the shadow of life. It exists. So long as you live, shadow exists." They came up, came up to that. And that is why they say that which is the self is the world. This self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent. This self will be permanent. That which is uh, permanent, everlasting, eternal, no subject to change. I shall endure as long as. So, these are the six views. Now you start with one wrong view. Then it proliferates, multiply into other wrong views. That is why the Buddha said, "Wrong, don't misrepresent the Dhamma. When you misrepresent the misrepresent the Dhamma, then you will be caught in this conceptual proliferation. You cannot get out of it. And that is why you have to be very careful about." Uh, Uh, holding on to dharma, with the good intention you learn dharma, good intention you want to be very faithful to dharma, and yet, eventually, if you do not understand the danger of holding on to dharma, you will end up having all these wrong views. On the other hand, well taught, uh, educated. Uh, Uh, person uh, who has uh, respect for the 
the skillful respect for the noble ones uh, who regards for the true man or true person with integrity and so on does not think that form feeling perception volition formation and consciousness and views are uh, mine i am there and they are my self does not believe and therefore this is no <clears throat> since he regard them thus he is not agitated about what is non existent now <clears throat> those who hold on to those things will always be agitated how they agitate it gives here and those who do not hold on to them will not be agitated now this is the reason why they agitate uh when this was said the certain bhikkhu asked the blessed one when the bhikkhu said can there be agitation about what is non existent eternally buddha said there can be bhikkhus then the buddha explained here a bhikkhu someone thinks thus alas i had it alas i have it no longer alas may i have it alas i do not get it then he sorrow grieves and lament he weeps breathing his breast and becomes distraught that is how there is agitation about what is non existent externally what is non existent externally self when buddha talked about a self does not exist externally then one would say ah i had it now he says i don't i have it no longer i had it before i don't have now i thought i had it i had this self now he says there's no and then then this monk asks when the boys are can there be no agitation about what is non existent externally there can be so put the give the answer here because someone does not think thus alas i had it alas i have i have it no longer alas may i have it alas i do not get it then he does not sorrow grieve and lament he does not weep beating his breast uh, he becomes uh, distraught that is how there is no agitation about what is non existent externally shouldn't i don't have to worry it was not there and if you put the said that is why buddha said the dhamma is is the truth so he said self does not exist externally that is true so that is dhamma then he asks can, can there be agitation about what is non existent internally that is even more serious so buddha said the self does not exist internally not only externally as a shadow does not exist internally inside uh so he listen to it listen to the teaching and says that which is the self is the world after that i shall be permanent it it and and so on i shall end here for everlasting he hears the tathagata or disciples of tathagata teaching the dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints uh, decisions obsessions uh, adherence 
and uh, underlying tendencies for the stilling of all uh, formations, for the uh, relinquishing, relinquishing of all attachment, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. That means <clears throat> Buddha or his disciple tells uh, here is the Tathagata. He teaches Dhamma. He teaches, what does he teach? Etan Santang, Etan Panityang, Etan Sabha Sankara Samato, Sabbu Padipati Nisagayo, Tannakayo Virago Nirodo Nibbana. That's what he teaches. Uh, here is the Tathagata Dhamma teaches, all stands for uh, uh, decision, elimination of all standpoint. Sabha Sankara Samato, Sabbu Padi Patini Sago, obsession, adherence, and underlying tendencies for the stilling of all formations, Sabha Sankara Samato, stilling of all formations, for the relinquishment of all attachment, Sabbu Padi Patini Sago, Upadi means uh, holding. Attachment, patinisag means relinquishing. You will hear this uh, passage in many, many times when you read Dhamma books, uh, explaining the qualities of the of Nibbana, qualities of Nibbana. What are they? Uh, elimination of all standpoints. All decisions, obsessions, adherence, and underlying intent. Adherence is uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, clinging. Uh, Upadi. Upadi. Not adher adherence is uh, uh, paramasa. Paramasa. Uh, <clears throat> you you hear the word sila but the paramasa paramasa is uh, uh, adherences and sammasana means reflection the opposite of sammasana is paramasana sammasati paramasati adherence uh, underlying tendencies uh, asava uh, asava, anusaya, anusaya, underlying tendencies. So adherences and underlying tendencies and uh, sabba sankara samato, all formations, sankara means formations, volitional formations, and all other formations, all other thoughts. Cessation, sabbhupadi, patinisag. Upadi means attachment, patinisag means relinquishing. For the destruction of craving, remember at the beginning of uh, the similes of 10 similes that we discussed earlier about uh, skeleton and uh, piece of meat and all this, all uh, are the dangers and uh, teaching is to abandon all the desires, destruction of craving. Destruction of craving is Nibbana. Arita said, you don't have to destroy craving. <laughs> they are not <laughs> obstructions. But here Buddha said, it is an obstruction. So letting go of craving. And for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. The teaching is directed towards this, attaining liberation. And then, when the Buddha teaches this, somebody who has not learned the Dhamma, not associated with the right person, 
and not care for their teaching and so forth he will say he will say so i shall be annihilated when you said your craving should be annihilated uh, destruction of craving is nibbana uh, cessation of all uh, uh, sankaras and so forth all this description for the stilling of all formations for the relinquishment of attachment for the destruction of craving for dispersion for cessation for nibbana he teaches the dhamma and then somebody who listens to it says i shall be annihilated he talks about annihilationism so i shall be i shall perish so i shall be no more then he sorrows griefs and laments he weeps beating his breast and becomes distraught that is how there is agitation about what is non existent internally that is far more important than non existence of self ex- externally we don't care whether self exists externally or not but if there is no if we learn about not having self inside then all this fear tension anxiety agitation arises <clears throat> then here because someone does not have views and so forth he will not be uh, agitated excited now there is another very famous uh, teaching that we find in other places as well uh because you may well acquire that possessions that is uh, impermanent everlasting eternal not subject to change and that might endure as long as eternity but do you see any such possession because can you see something do you see something which is permanent eternal and so on no venerable sir so about the confirming in good because i do not i to do not see and so forth then buddha said because you may well cling to that doctrine of self read this very carefully you may well cling to that doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair in one who clings to it but do you see any such doctrine of self <laughs> no venerable sir i do do not see any doctrine of self that would not arouse sorrow as long as you, you see you learn any doctrine which try to promote sor- self then you will end up sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair because you do not find that self in in yourself that is why we say about the thought the truth you may well take uh, uh, well take as support as that view that would not arouse sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair so he is he taught the dhamma that would not bring us uh sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair what is that dhamma he has but because uh good because and then he asked the because there being a self would there be for me what belongs to a self if there is self there must be yes when the boss said oh they are being what belongs to a self would there be for me self yes when the boss said because they are being a self would there be for me what belong with there is a self there must be something that belongs to self so 
or their being what belongs to a self would there be for me a self if there is something belongs to self then self also should be there since a self and what belongs to self are not apprehended as true and established then this stand point for view namely that which is the self is the world after that i shall be permanent eternal everlasting and so on uh, would not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching <laughs> that is what buddha wanted to say <clears throat> then because what do you think is material form permanent or impermanent we see this in anatta lakana sutta in uh, our vandana book we read that very often uh, this is a very very important thing to remember in fact this whole discourse uh, this must be the essence of whole discourse is material form permanent or impermanent impermanent when rebirth sir is what is impermanent suffering or happy happiness suffering when rebirth sir is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be a figure that does this is mine this i am this is myself no when rebirth sir now to make it short i must say you remember five aggregates is there anybody who does not know five aggregates form feeling perception volitional formations and consciousness these five buddha said they are not uh, mine i have not them they are not myself okay each of them that is not self that is not mine that is not i that is not myself so then finally he says seeing thus bhikkhus well taught noble disciple disenchanted with material form disenchanted with the feeling disenchanted with the perception disenchanted with formation disenchanted conscious so one who sees that self does not exist they are not i they don't belong to me these five aggregates are without self then one becomes disenchanted with these five aggregates where are these five aggregates us us disenchantment does not mean we say disenchantment uh, normally in a negative sense but the word disenchantment uh, or nibbind pali word nibbindati nibbindati means uh, neither negative but not uh, not negative it is positive in the sense that we have a realistic attitude towards the five aggregates here nibbida means realistic attitude this enchantment means we are, we are not uh, clinging to it no do we reject it we cannot cling to the body feeling and so on no can we discard them but we accept them as 
they are. We accept the five aggregates as they are. When we say as they are, what do we mean? What do we what do we mean by that? Impermanent, unsatisfactory, without self. Impermanent, unsatisfactory, without self. If it is impermanent, can we make it permanent? This body, feeling, perception, thought, volition, formation, consciousness are impermanent. Can we make them impermanent if they don't? If we don't like impermanence, suppose we don't like impermanence, what are we going to do? Can we make it permanent? No. Then what should we do? Accept impermanence. If we cannot fight, join. <laughs> what else we can do? Join. Once we join, what do we do? What we do do? Go along with that. Accept it. Accepting. We don't get agitated. We don't be upset. We don't be disappointed. We accept it and live. When we are sick, get medicine. Because sickness is not permanent. Medicine is not permanent. Medicine must change in order to bring us, in order to cure us. If the medicine remains without changing, permanent in, a, in, the, in the same form that we put in, it doesn't do anything. That must, it, the chemical in the medicine must change to assimilate to the body, to get us well. So that is also impermanent. Accepting impermanence is healthier than not accepting it. When we do not accept impermanence, we get sick. When we accept impermanence, we get well. Because we go along with that and do what we are supposed to do and so forth. So, <clears throat> well to our noble disciples become disenchanted. That means he does not reject it, does not cling to it, accept the reality. This is how we must understand the word disenchantment in the Buddha's teaching with the perception and so forth. Be, being, see, being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through the dispassion, his mind is liberated. Mind is liberated from what? From wrong views. Liberated from wrong grasp. Liberated from suffering. We do, do all these things to free from suffering. So, when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. This is also very important things to remember. Many people think they are, they will be, uh, they attain Nibbana, they attain enlightenment after death. Or there is no more rebirth after death. So they think Rebirth process stops after this life. But that's how many people think. But they see the possibility of rebirth comes to an end in this very life. Only then that only then they know I will, will not be reborn. While having the possibility, potential for rebirth, you cannot think, you cannot stop rebirth. So, 
That is why in Mahasati Pattana Sutta Bunda said, Jati Dhammana Bikya Satana Eva Icha Upajati Aho Vatamayana Jati Dhamma Sama Nacha Vatano Jati Naga Chiyati Nakopaneta Icha Patabha. Being subject to birth, one might think, May I not be reborn again? That wish never come to fulfill. That is not getting what one wants and explaining not getting what one wants is suffering. Not getting what one wants is suffering. So one does not want to be born again. That is what one does not want. That is suffering. In order to stop that suffering, one must not be simply thinking that I should not be reborn again while having the potential in us. What is the potential for rebirth? Craving, desire to exist. If the desire is completely annihilated in this life, then only can we not have rebirth. So the Arahant, who has eliminated the cause of suffering that is craving, knows I have done. I am done. Nothing more to do. I will not have rebirth. Only then he can say, may I not have rebirth again. Until such time, by so wishing, it will never happen. So, Arahans, because Uh, this bhikkhu is called one whose crossbar has been lifted. This is an arahant whose trench has been filled in, whose pillar has been uprooted, one who has no bolt, a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. So Buddha explained these terms. And how is the bhikkhu one whose crossbar has been lifted? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned ignorance. He has cut off all roots, made it like a palm stump, done away with it, so that it is no longer subject to future rising. So, one of the two co- one of the two causes of rebirth is ignorance. Abandon ignorance. That is what we learn in Artisha Samuppada. Avijja Pachya Sankara. That is one cause. So he has eliminated that. Then Cut off all the roots, all the root. Root of existence is avijja, ignorance. Made it like a palm stump. This is a very beautiful simile. The palm stump simile is given in uh, uh, monks, uh, when monks cease to be a fully ordained bhikkhu, tala uh, vattukata. That is, uh, palm tree, when uh, when you cut it off at the uh, ground level, it will never grow again. But <coughs> suppose there is a palm tree, you have a very sharp sword or knife. And there is a Hercules type powerful person. With one blow, he cuts it across. And the palm, still, palm tree still will stand, will remain standing. From, out, from outside look, palm tree seems to be standing. But is it alive? It can never grow again. But it appears 
to be standing appears to be a life. Similarly, an arahant cuts off his root of existence, but he is still alive. And ordinarily, when you look at him, he looks to us just like anybody else, eating, drinking, walking, talking, smiling, and so forth. But he does not have a scruple of craving, minutest amount of craving for anything he does. He can eat without any greed. He talk without any desire. He drinks without any desire. Smell, taste, touch, and so on. He does without any desire in him. But he appears from or from any point of view like an ordinary person. From any angle you look at him, ordinary person. But in him there is no desire. Talavatukata. Done away with it so that it is no longer subject to future arising. <clears throat> and that is the time he can say, I am done. I don't want any more rebirth because he has already finished it. Then, how is the bhikkhu one who is trench has been filled? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned the round of rebirth that brings renewed beings. So once he has destroyed his ignorance, then he is complete, full. Fill the ditch. You see, fill the trench has been filled. There is no gap. It's complete, full. Then how is the bhikkhu one who has, pillar has been uprooted, here a bhikkhu has abandoned craving, has cut it off the root. He is a craving. One, he dis, one, say, one root of existence is ignorance, other root of existence is craving. And that is what we see in the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta. The, in the first sermon, Buddha said, the very same craving is completely abandoned. That is the end of rebirth. So Dhamma Chakra Pavatana shows, Pavatana Sutta uh, gives craving as the root of existence. Paticca Samuppada tells us ignorance is the root of existence. So these two destroy it. Then when he destroyed these two, he can very affirmatively say there is no more rebirth. I will not be, I don't want to be reborn again. Uh, bold. Okay. And how is the bhikkhu one who has no bold? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned the five lower fetters. You are bolted down to the earth with the five lower fetters. Five, the five lower, lower fetters. Sakkaiditi, Vichigicca, Silabhata Paramasa, Kamaraga, Vyapada. These five call five lower fetters. Sakkaiditi means view of personal, view of self in these five aggregates. Vichigicca, doubt about the Buddha, Dhamma and so on. Uh, Sila Bhatta Paramasa. Paramasa, as I mentioned, adherence to rites and rituals. Again, Sammasana. Paramasana means attachment, adhering. Kamaraga, desire for sensual pleasures. Vyapada, hatred. These are the five fetters that 
will bolt one down to the earth. So, he has no, uh, no bolt. <laughs> he is not anchored to the ground. Then how is the bhikkhu, a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered? Here bhikkhu has abandoned the conceit. I am asmimana. When you attain the full enlightenment, this is the last thing to give up. Asmimana. Ruparaga, Aruparaga, Mana, Uddhacha, Vichigicha. Mana there, Asmimana. The conceit, I am. I am is a conceit. As he mentioned, Tanna, Mana, Ditti. We abandon Ditti views, abandon craving, abandon conceit. <coughs> So, because when goals with Indra, Siddh, Maharas, and so on and so forth, they do not find anything of which they could say the consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. Why is that? One has gone, one thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. The Tathagata is untraceable even here and now. This is a very profound statement, although it appears to be very simple. Tathagata means, uh, Tathagata refers to an enlightened being, fully enlightened being. Fully enlightened being is not the body, not the feeling, not the perception, not the volition, formation, so consciousness but the state of attainment, the state you cannot see. Although, just like that palm tree, you cannot say the palm tree is alive because it does not bring the nourishment from the earth or the, from the air into it to sustain its life once it is cut off from the root. Although it stands up, you cannot say that palm tree is alive. Dead palm tree is standing just like live palm tree. The root of all existence of a person is completely cut off. There are nothing is there to survive after death. So I think we must end here. There is more to <coughs> talk. We, we continue the rest in the afternoon and then discussion. Thank mm -hmm. you.